All right, welcome back to the Barbell Medicine Podcast. This is episode number 26. We're here with Dr. Spencer Nadolsky. He's an obesity medicine specialist, a board certified family medicine practitioner, and founder of Docs Who Lifts. We're going to get into the nuances of obesity, exercise, medicine, and much, much more. Like patients get mad when they find out that a doctor put obesity on their on their diagnosis codes and they get their chart. And the reason this is important is because those maybe with a, a class three or class two, class even class one, but their stages are higher. Maybe we just need to be more aggressive with those first. Because right now, most guidelines just use the BMI, or at least they did. And that's what most doctors are aware of. But we need to see where you're storing the fat because when you start controlling for BMI, if if you look at waist circumference, then the higher waist circumference will increase your risk of death. Obviously, the whole idea is when we eat excess energy, more energy we're taking in than we're burning. Our bodies are supposed to normally expand and our adipose cells or tissues are supposed to expand to, to store that excess energy. And that's not necessarily pathological. What's pathological is when they don't expand anymore and then all of a sudden we have these free floating fatty acids all over our blood and causing issues. Obesity itself, when we have this excess weight, there are a lot of pathological things going on. Like I said, it's easier said than done just to, hey, you just gotta eat a little bit less. When you feel like crap trying to do that, uh, it's not so fun. It's frustrating it's for patients. Welcome back to the Barbell Medicine Podcast. This is episode number 26. We're joined with the two most handsome doctors that I know, Dr. Baraki and Dr. Spencer Nadolsky. Yeah, so uh, thanks for having me on the show. I'm Dr. Spencer Nadolsky. I'm 34 years young, um, obesity and family medicine physician. Um, And my training background, I actually, my whole background is in sports like wrestling and football Uh, so that's really like in high school got into strength training to get better at performance essentially that was pretty much it so i wouldn't call myself a competitive power lifter by any means but i i got pretty strong uh in order to get better at wrestling and football you and austin actually played real sports so like you're like a division one wrestler and then austin swam uh meanwhile uh, i was a cheerleader (laughs) <laughs> yeah, well, I was polishing barbells as well. That was like my thing. It was like uh, oh, cool. polishing them with my with my with my skin. Um, so <laughs> wait, you went you went to Michigan or Michigan State? I went to Michigan State first. Ended up transferring to UNC Chapel Hill. These are yeah. If you haven't heard of these schools, uh, <laughs> you, can, you can Google them. So and and you wrestled at a very high level. Did you go to like national championships or what's the what's yeah, the story so, there? Yeah, uh, so. I was ranked most of my career at my senior year. I was ranked in the top three at one point, uh, wrestled in the, um, the all-star match, which was the, actually the number one guy got hurt. So then it went down to the number two and three guy. <laughs> I ended up losing that match in overtime, but I always choked at nationals, but all, of, all around had a really good career um, and uh, academic All-American and everything like that. So I didn't know we were, talking with a wrestling celebrity here, you know, but <laughs> that's, uh, that's really- I don't know if you've heard of Kyle Snyder. So he's like the big, big name. Now he's one of the greatest, uh, wrestlers and heavyweight wrestlers, uh, guy. And he's, he's a phenom, but, uh, not as good as he, he is or, or, or anything like that. But, um, they did pretty well. Well, it sounds like, it sounds, I was going to say, it sounds like you're uh, athletically more accomplished than either of us are. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, I want to I want to talk about my cheerleading history for a while here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, that's really cool. And, and then, just as an aside, so your brother Carl with a, a K is uh, he's an endocrinologist. He did uh, went through the military for his medical uh, training and uh, was also a wrestler. Is that that's true, right? Yep. Yeah, he and he was so he's five foot five, you know, and I'm five, uh, six two, and so like his weight class was one forty nine, one fifty seven. I was a heavyweight, but um, yeah, he did extreme, pretty much similar career that I that I had. Um, uh, very good wrestler, um, yeah, and then he went the endocrine route. And how many times have you body slammed a patient? Just that I just like, <laughs> <laughs> there, there have been times where I've really contemplated it, but bedside manner, I've I've been told that's frowned upon. <laughs> All right. Uh, on the internet, you can do whatever you want. You can put, uh, <laughs> yeah, so that's uh, that's cool. All right, so uh, Spencer is with us today. He is an obesity 
uh, a board certified obesity specialist. We're going to talk about obesity uh, screening for it, um, what to do about it, where the the general trends are going, and then uh, Austin and I will will uh, will chime in. But uh, it's really a pleasure to have you here. Um, let's let's get this thing started. So <clears throat> you're a board certified obesity specialist. Uh, can you define like what obesity is from a medical standpoint, and what is the clinical utility of actually like diagnosing somebody with obesity, putting it on their, you know, problem list. Yeah. So in the past, it's been simply like an anthropometric measure. And, you know, you guys, obviously, medical school and and residency kind of learned that standard BMI definition. It's anthropometrically uh, um, diagnosed. So anybody over a 30 BMI, body mass index, uh, kilograms per meter squared, and I know everybody listening to this will be like, oh, BMI, uh, it's not a very useful thing because we're all have so much muscle and our BMIs are always <laughs> in the overweight or obese category and we're not obese or overweight. But that's th- so we can get into the nuances of that. But uh, that's that's the standard anthropometric. Uh, <laughs> that's the standard anthropometric definition. Now, they are moving to a, a more what we'd call clinical diagnosis along with this uh, classification because over a 30 BMI is considered class one obesity over 35. And then when you get to 35 BMI, you're class two. And then once you get to 40 and above, it's class three. What most people think of as like a a morbid obesity, but now a a, a more technical term would be class three obesity. If you're over a a 40 BMI, they're not using super obesity. No, I thought (laughs) that that would be like, you know, I still, I still like patients get mad when they find out that a doctor put obesity on their on their diagnosis codes and they get their chart. I can only imagine if it says super obesity. <laughs> I'd be like, what? Yeah, people would be upset. That would, that would piss me off too. Um, anyway, <laughs> anyway, and then and then overweight is any anything over the the twenty five to thirty uh, category, which a lot of people listening are probably in that category. Um, but now we're going to more of, uh, we're also adding this staging in. So that's classification of just simply body mass index and, and weight. So now they have, uh, what's called staging, whereas you start using weight related comorbidity. So a stage zero would be, you have absolutely no medical issues from your excess weight, meaning no knee pain, no back pain, no blood sugar issues, no blood uh, pressure, no dyslipidemia, no reflux, no sleep apnea, urinary incontinence, anything like that. No, nothing like that. Stage one would be like subclinical versions of those. So maybe you're getting a little bit of knee pain and it's likely from your weight, but maybe it's not clinically like osteoarthritis or anything like that. Uh, maybe your blood sugars are in that pre-diabetic range. Um, maybe your blood pressure is you know, just in that pre-hypertensive range, although now it's like, yes, it seems like everybody's diagnosed it with the new guidelines as, as hypertensive. But regardless, it's more of that subclinical um, uh, uh, range. Then uh, class two is where then you actually have these comorbidities like type two diabetes, uh, hypertension, sleep apnea. And then th- stages three and four are just more severe. Stage four would be like end stage versions of that. Um, and what they find is that those with, say, even a class three obesity, uh, so class three, remember, is 40 BMI and above. And if they're staged at a zero, meaning they have no medical issues from that, they actually they can actually do OK. And I'm not saying that's like a healthy at every size because this process is <laughs> dynamic. But if if you take them from us, if you compare a stage zero compared to like a stage two or three and four, those stages twos, threes, and fours are going to have a much higher mortality and morbidity uh, rate. So it's, and the reason this is important is because those maybe with a, a, uh, a class three or class two class, even class one, but their stages are higher. Maybe we just need to be more aggressive with those first. Uh, I tend to be aggressive with everybody, but, um, but that's, that's, that, that's kind of the clinical reasoning behind that. So, so just to clarify for our audience who may have gotten a little mixed up with some of the, some of the words you were using, there's a difference between the class and mm-hmm. the state and the stage, which is important yeah. to understand. So the classification yeah. class one, two, three, 
has to do with the BMI number and the yep. staging has to do with how bad or whether there are uh, complications of it. And that's actually the same system that like nephrologists use to classify and grade like kidney disease and stuff like that. And you, we can see this like spectrum chart of like the higher your class along with the higher your grade, you get a spectrum of worse and worse and worse prognosis. Yes, absolutely correct. Yeah, I actually think it's interesting. So BMI like was originally invented like back in the 1800s. This guy like Adolf Ketele was this French social, you know, anthropometry nerd. He was like, I want to find what is the average man. And so he like came up with uh, a weight over uh, height squared. Like that was his thing. And it just disappeared into obscurity uh, basically until like the 50s, 60s. And then Ansel Keys brought it back uh, in the in the 70s. Because they were previously using just weight to height ratios, like the Metropo Metropolitan Life Insurance Company was like, hey, if you have this elevated uh, weight to height ratio, just a singular, there was no square in there, uh, then you're, you're, your risk for dying like kind of scaled with that, kind of, not perfectly. And they were like, how do we make this data better? These are like data on millions of Americans. And Ansel Keys comes out of, I assume, you know somewhere in Minnesota, he raises his hand and says, Hey, why don't we just use this BMI thing? And, and that's kind of how it came to fruition. Um, so we were, I mean, like, uh, Spencer said, we've been using BMI to sort of predict based on somebody, just simple anthropom anthropometric uh, measurements, whether somebody was at higher risk for premature death or premature like development of diseases that we could potentially, you know, catch and, and, and manage early on. It just, it's not as sensitive and specific as we'd like it to be, uh, mainly because it just doesn't tell you enough about the person, right? Somebody could have a, a be overweight based on BMI or even obese based on BMI and not have clinical markers of disease, which is why this, this sort of uh, category, a uh, staging uh, system uh, is useful. Um, there's been also a push to also include like a waist circumference in addition to BMI, like combining those makes the BMI metric more useful. So basically if you have somebody with a overweight or obese B, uh, number based on BMI and then their waist circumference is elevated. So like uh, above 40 inches for a man or 37 inches for, for a woman, then you're like, okay, now I know that this is a more significant risk. Do you have any uh, commentary about using that? Like in your clinical practice, is that something you yeah, do regularly? It's extremely important. And it's, it's pushed amongst all obesity physicians because yeah, because, because right now most, guidelines just use the BMI, or at least they did. And that's what most doctors are aware of. But we need to see where you're storing the fat, because when you start controlling for BMI, if if you look at waist circumference, then the higher waist circumference will increase your risk of death. And that's, you know, I'm sure you guys have talked about, you know, adiposopathy or, or whatever the, 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 the cent central storing of fat, and why that's a risk factor. But you know, very important, because there will be guys that actually come in that have maybe they have a normal BMI, but they're storing it all in their waist. And those those people have probably have the disease of obesity and you see all their comorbidities it's like, yeah, technically, according to BMI, you're, you're you don't have obesity allegedly from that measure. But your waist is pretty high and you have type two diabetes or you, you have prediabetes metabolic syndrome. Uh, you're at an increased re risk of death. So, yeah, very important. Austin, do you use that like when you're talking to patients or, or, or clients, if you see somebody with a normal BMI or even if it, they're in the overweight uh, category and you see their waist circumference is like approaching 40 or, or greater than 40. Uh, and, and just before you answer this, I want to be crystal clear that this like 40 inch marker for like people in North America that scales to all, nearly all heights. Like if you're six foot five and your waist is 40 inches, like the best data we have at, at present suggests that it's still a risk. I mean, do you use that to guide their sort of nutritional or conditioning management? Yes. Yeah, I definitely get it on pretty much everybody in a clinical setting. You know, if it's over 40, that'll impact my management for a, from a coaching training perspective. Let's say I have a novice or even a post novice trainee who's uh, who's in the upper 30s, for example. Yeah, that's going to impact how I uh, how I program for them and as well how we manage their nutrition because we they may not be or they're they're not going to be in that case in an aggressive weight gain situation to put on a bunch of mass and gain a bunch of strength if that's what they're after um, in the coaching world so yeah that ab abdominal obesity thing is uh, is pretty tough to, to deal with or ignore rather what well, you know you're like hey your waist circumference is 40 inches uh, ah, let's just ignore it like it's well, probably you no know, so there there are you know you guys get it <clears throat> all the time as well and I get it you know you get these lifters and they're like BMI is worthless and I'm like okay well what's your waist and it's like well it's like a you know 39 it's like it's 
clothes. I mean, it's like, I mean, because you could even look down and, and probably say 38 for a male. And then you can get into some real nuances there. But it's like, if your waist is borderline, like, around that metabolic syndrome range, and you're saying that your BMI doesn't matter, it's like, it, yeah, it, it probably does. It's it's just one of those things I'm like, sorry, it, it kind of does, though. You know, one of those things like... Most people are not as jacked as they think. <laughs> no, I, you know, I feel bad. I'm always like, yeah, you got a lot of muscle, but, you know, you still got some excess weight there, so... <laughs> yeah, I mean, on the one hand, like, it, like BMI is always going to have this right-tailed skew, particularly in the United States. I mean, just because our average... BMI is above it is in the obese range or like 27 point something. I mean, that's the, and it's been like that. So when we changed the sort of BMI cutoffs, like a lot, millions of people became overweight and obese, like overnight, like that, that, that happened. But, and so people will say, well, BMI is it's not terribly useful. It's like, well, it's, it's useful for comparing populations, just, to, just using that, like that's useful. But then when you put a BMI and a waist circumference together, which are both just me- straight up measurements, I mean, you have a pretty powerful screening tool to say, is this person at risk? And then you go down the road, like what you were talking about earlier about assessing, do they have problems with blood sugar, uh, cholesterol, you know, GERD, stuff, stuff like that, sleep apnea. I mean, it's, yeah, that's I why it's useful. People, people need to understand it's, it's an easy screening tool for doctors. It, it, we shouldn't live and die by a stupid calculation that's good for population uh, epidemiology, but, but, but it's, it's easy and it's quick and it's, it's, it, it does a decent job at screening. It's up to the clinician to actually do a deeper dive and actually individualize. If they're living and dying by that stupid number, then there, that's a problem. And it does happen all the time. Uh, but it's, it's, it's good and, and easy for screening. So, um, ideally people would have a DEXA scan and we'd look exactly where they're holding their weight and everything like that. But that's, expensive you know exposes people to a little not much radiation but a little bit and um uh so yeah i mean ideal situation we have all that yeah so do you actually you routinely order a dexa scan or some sort of body fat analysis no i don't i you i mean i can i can tell like you can look at (laughs) you can look at somebody but i (laughs) you look at somebody you can say pull up your shirt and let's do a waist circumference and you're just like you got the obesity, you know, it's, it's, uh, you can tell right away and just, but, you know, just to, to make sure that patients, uh, don't feel like you're just brushing them off. It's, it's good to do a full clinical analysis. Yeah. I think, I mean, that's a question we get all the time is, you know, when should I get my body fat tested? And and I, I think the idea of getting additional testing, it really for any particular medical condition is that if it will a- a change what you're doing about it, right? So, yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I think most people who are in the physical culture, uh, particularly if they have any sort of medical uh, or anthropometric training, e- either way, they can assess readily, um, visually, this person has, you know, uh, lipodystrophy or has their body fat distribution is centered mostly, you know, in their abdomen or, or something like that. Uh, yeah. You know, people may miss that and they they may have uh, their own subjective biases that are affecting how they how they assess that. But very rarely for me is a body fat test from either DEXA or bioelectrical impedance or hydrostatic weight going to change what I'm doing about it. Uh, if I had a clinician who asked me, you know, they curbsided me for whatever reason, mostly through my DMs. I assume this is how this would work, like a, <laughs> a barbell medicine consult through my direct messages. And they said, hey, uh, should I get a body fat on this person? I'm like, well, if you can't tell based on your BMI and their waist circumference, then sure. But I, I wouldn't, you know, so. I, Austin, I haven't would had it, a, yeah, I haven't had a case where I've had actually had to do it they just want to do it so i'm like yeah sure go ahead i don't know yes yeah. yeah i mean that's what that's, that's what i recommend to clients if it's something that's going to markedly change that their their compliance with whatever intervention we're going to do then I'll, I'll do it but otherwise yeah i think it's not a super good use of resources um okay cool so so you're an obesity specialist what does that mean uh take that you know some people may not be familiar with that they're like oh did you do an obesity residency i assume this was on like the biggest loser you and jillian michaels hung out no what's the what's the deal <laughs> Yeah, no. So I think it was what is 2012 or 2013. The American Board of Obesity Medicine formed. It was a, a multiple, um, multiple organizations got together and decided it was time to form uh, an obesity uh, board certification. Now they are trying to go through and get recognized nationally, so that there's a true. There ends up being a fellowship, and that you can put your uh, little special specialty in 
into the insurances so you can be referred to as a specialist. But it's kind of like how sleep medicine was not that long ago where people were just calling themselves uh, sleep medicine specialists and uh, anybody and everybody could do it, family, doctors, whatever. Now it's now there's a fellowship. It's usually neurologists and, and um, pulmonologists and even uh, I think psychi- psychiatrists can do it too. But but yeah, so it's American Board of Obesity Medicine. Uh, you study, you get enough um, CME credits, and then you can take the uh, examination after your uh, residency. Uh, so like Austin could do it uh, next year if you wanted to. Um, A-bomb. Get the, uh, get the yeah. A-bomb. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so it, it's supposed to standardize because you, know, you see a lot of people out there just – I mean they're still pushing HCG diets and they're pushing – you know, protein supplements are good. I mean, I know you got your um, your Whey RX, and I've done multiple supplements like that myself, and those are very evidence-based. But you know, a lot of these people are pushing their own supplements and kind of the wild, wild west of obesity medicine. So at least if somebody's a, you know a diplomate of the American Board of Obesity Medicine, a bomb, uh, you at least know they had some standard <laughs> standardization of their of their training. But I I still see some of those people. They just got their certification. They studied. And they, now they're still uh, being hucksters out there, but uh, at least there's some standard standardization. Yeah, I, I think that's probably. I think it's probably more good than bad. Uh, just on the whole, it, there's been some allegations about the American Board of Obesity Medicine, and it's uh, that you know there. I mean, there's been some funding ties to like Coca Cola and like you know, you know other what people in the uh, fitness blogosphere, all right, not the academic areas, but the blogosphere would say, oh, well, hey, man, you can't, you can't listen to these guys. They're, fun, they're funded by Coke, big Coke, big soda. You know, would you have any response to that? You know, there's the people, people are, were, are basically saying, you know what, we can't listen to the thing you say because uh, you're taking money from big sugar. Yeah. So I think it's the, I think you're speaking about the obesity society specifically has had sponsorships and the obesity society is very well entwined with the, uh, the ABOM is technically separate, but they're always presenting and they're always there. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I think, I think there is a little bit of a conflict of, I think there can be a conflict of interest. Cause I've at, at some point it's like, well, who cares? We, we need the money. We, you know, <laughs> we need the money. We need the money to do these studies and stuff like that. But, you know, as you know, there there's research looking into how that can have some potential impact. It should it shouldn't it sh- if the science is science and it was, the trials were done correctly and ethically, there shouldn't be an influence. But, um, you know, it tends, it tends to be more positive studies and those that are sponsored by whoever drug companies and and things like that. So I, I think ideally. We just have money to do all the studies we want and not have any biases, but unfortunately, um, that's not the case. So, you know, it's a it's a touchy situation. Like, because I understand, need money to to run studies, but at the same time, you don't want to take money from a company that's been part of the obesity epidemic <laughs> with big sodas, uh, big soda. Uh, Austin, you have you have any comment uh, comments on on that sort of thing? Well, I don't, I don't think I have anything to add. I mean, I agree with that. The the you know, with with uh, with proper study design, you would hope to minimize the risk of that sort of thing. But then you still run into issues about publication bias and stuff like that as to whether or not it ultimately ends up even appearing in the literature anywhere. But I mean, I know Spencer is more involved with those organizations, at least as of now. So I would defer to him for the details. But, yeah, maybe I'll maybe I'll join the A-bomb. We'll see. <laughs> A-bomb. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I just think in general. Yeah. So funding has to come from somewhere. I, we are all subject to biases, and I, I, I do agree with Spencer, though, that, you know, so the science is what the science is. And if you're doing – if you're trying your best to be ethical and, 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 and uh, you know, just assess the data for what it is, then, you know, hopefully uh, uh, the science makes its way to the forefront, you know, overcomes this thing. I, I think where there is conflict of interest, that's true on the other side, too, right? If you are saying, well, because these are funded by X – Right. You if, if you have any sort of business that's tied to X being evil or wrong, you know, whatever, you have a conflict of interest, too. So it's on both sides, except for you don't happen to be funding research. Right. You know, like so there's no positive upside there other than you're basically saying, well, you guys uh, may be wrong. OK, but what are you doing about it? Yeah. 
he's just know. complaining, you know, and it's like, all right, well, I don't necessarily know uh, uh, if I should listen, if, you know, other other than, yeah, there's bias everywhere and there's conflict of interest everywhere. Yeah, yeah just taking it, I, I think taking it into consideration and understanding for what it is, but it, it's hard. I, I mean, I understand what they're saying, but I, I what, what else are we going to do? You got to, someone's got to pay for these things. Yeah. Hey, yeah. If you're going to call a conflict of interest, that's cool. Where's I need a couple million dollars, dude. Yeah. Like, just, oh, and you don't have it. Well, yeah. <laughs> big, big milk is going to fund my next, you know, uh, uh, a protein supplement right. study. You know, it's like, big dairy. I like the idea of big, big milk, big, big dairy, big dairy. Um, okay. So, uh, rising obesity rates have been like a hot topic in the health sector for a long time. It's like every news, uh, you know, uh, anchor is saying, you know, obesity on the rise, you know, that's, a, that's a thing. Uh, the latest data has suggested actually that it's leveled off, you know, the rate, you know, so the, about one third of Americans, for instance, are uh, classified as obese, but that's been kind of stable. What would you say is the biggest cause for that? The leveling off? That's a good, it's a good question. I mean, some of these, I think we talked about this before. I think we were chatting on the phone a couple months ago about how like, yeah, everybody's like, it's just expanding. It's an epidemic. And yeah, it's, it's highly prevalent, but that, but that, um, uh, that increases has leveled off. I don't know the exact reason other than, you know, maybe the food supply and, and our, and our circuitry and our brains are starting to level off. Uh, at some point there are, there are certain classes of the obesity, like, like those class threes, those really, uh, yeah, those been going up. Those are still increasing. And then the pediatric thing that, that can, that that's kind of leveled off as well. Maybe we hit that expansive, uh, maybe we're hitting, hitting the threshold of how much, you know, adipose we can expand <laughs> given our food supply. <laughs> I, I don't the know. The upper I mean, limit of, yeah. I would hope that it's it's due to um, you know environmental change, but I don't feel like anything that crazy has has changed. I mean, they're looking at sugar taxes and stuff, but that hasn't been. There's there's been some studies looking at it in Mexico with some with some positive improvements, and then they've done Philly, and then I think a few of these other places mixed results. But um, you know, I don't I don't know because the the, the A bomb, you know, the obesity doctors were <laughs> we haven't made a huge. Day. I don't think we've made a huge dent. Yeah, it's hopefully that more and more people get to know and that there you know, it can be one more layer of having doctors that are able to help with the process, not be the only uh, component, but uh, making a multidisciplinary approach. So I'm, I'm not sure um, exactly. That's I'm it. just hoping that maybe we're just – maybe we're putting a halt to it. I don't think it's going to reverse anytime soon. What I'm hoping is that we're able to prevent it in the first place with people. It's going to be pretty tough though. It seems to me that if we wanted to have a good explanation for what's causing the changes in these rates, that it would it would help us to have a very clear understanding as to like the mechanisms of obesity as to like why it happens. And you did mention like some of the interventions that have tried some with more success than others. And I think we probably have some ideas as to why some work better than others. But you mentioned something like the brain circuitry being involved. And I know there's this discussion about obesity as a disease. Uh, could you briefly talk about that in terms of like mechanisms and how the brain's involved? I like talking about the brain. So, yeah, 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 no, very good stuff. So the whole idea, because this is actually a big topic on, on the Internet. People get really heated and emotional about the idea of obesity as a disease. And so it was I think it was 2013 when the American um, Medical Society, the AMA, classified it as a disease and they had five criteria you know, increased morbidity, harm, and all these all these other things, um, and it and it's and it seems to fit as a disease. And most people think of obesity as just a, a result of gluttony, sloth, laziness type of thing, and that it's your choice whether you want to be uh, whether you want to have obesity or not. And what we find is that there's true path pathology going on. Obviously, the whole idea is when we eat excess energy, more energy that we're taking in than we're burning, our bodies are supposed to normally expand and our adipose cells or tissues are supposed to expand to, to store that excess energy. And that's not necessarily pathological. What's pathological is when they don't expand anymore and then all of a sudden we have these free-floating fatty acids all over our blood and causing issues. But obesity itself – when we have this excess weight, there are a lot of pathological things going on. So like, for instance, people that um, 
uh, that have this excess weight, obviously from from a physiological manner, they can have increased blood sugars, uh, blood pressures, um, uh, dyslipidemias. And then we call that the adiposopathy, the, 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 the sickness from fat. But then we have what's called fat mass disease. So sleep apnea, just having excess weight around your neck, mm-hmm. having excess uh, – <laughs> yeah, look at Jordan's neck is huge. <laughs> uh, having having just excess weight, which causes uh, uh, more pressure on our knees, causing osteoarthritis, and then there's probably some inflammatory processes going on too with the phys- physiology there. Reflux. So when, if you if you think of like hypertension, why is that a disease? Well, it's because of of because it can harm you. It can it can kill you, right? But the really the only harm from hypertension is then is the end stage of that, which would be a cardiovascular or stroke. So then what would be the precursor to hypertension? For most part, it's lifestyle related and a lot of it's related to weight. So obesity is a precursor to all these other end stage disease processes. Type 2 diabetes, why is type 2 diabetes really a disease? And you know, why, why do we call that a disease? Well, you know, because these processes are going on. Well, the same similar process is just in a almost a subclinical manner are occurring with obesity. So that's kind of why we call it, I, I think we should call it a disease. But regarding the brain, so the other thing is, well, it's just a choice, right? It's, it's we, we should just eat less and move more, which is true from a physics standpoint. We do need to decrease our energy balance. But there's actually, when we gain weight, there can be some pathological things going on. So that inflammation that we have from that excess weight around our abdomen, there can be some signals that disrupt our circuitry in our brain that cause us to 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 be hungrier than what we are and to crave more the food than what we would if we were leaner and have dysfunctions. And so having those people just eat less and move more is a lot harder, uh, easier said than done. Uh, and we can get more into that based on how much you guys want. want. Well, so, I mean, I, I mentioned it because this is a topic that we harp on a lot is that the eat less, move more kind of recommendation would be the standard logical thing to do in order to manage something like obesity. But we see that that is, you know, again, we, we, we talk about humans as these complex biological organisms and just applying that mantra to them doesn't work very consistently because it's very complex under the hood. These brain signaling mechanisms, behavioral uh, adaptations, um, you know, it's it's just super, super complex. And so I think it's overly reductionistic. And that's probably why a lot of people get frustrated and burn out with their attempts and stuff like that. And they end up going from diet to diet to diet and, you know, searching for a magical solution like that. Yeah. So, I, I you know, most people think of bio, like uh, obesity as psych- psychological. That's why, you know, kind of the laziness, it's just you're just lazy. You don't have enough willpower. But if we look at it and add in that physiological component, of course, there's a strong psychological component. We're not animals. We have social interactions. Sure. We we enjoy food. <laughs> <laughs> we we enjoy we enjoy food. Jordan's created putting his huge hang like huge uh, ribeyes on the grill and stuff like that. Um, and people enjoy enjoy food, talking with each other. It's it's completely different than animals, but. If we add in that physiological component to where our body fights us as we lose weight, uh, as we try to lose weight anyway, once we get up to a certain weight, and and it's it's like I said, it's easier said than done. Just to yeah, you just got to eat a little bit less. When you feel like crap trying to do that, uh, it's not so fun. It's frustrating for patients. Well, yeah, I mean that's basically you're getting negative feedback on your behavioral changes. Which it, it, and on the flip side of that, when you get positive feedback, you, it makes your dieting experience not only more successful, but but the compliance better. So the rapid results tend to improve compliance. You get positive feedback. Um, so yeah, it, it, I think the take home from from the mechanistic discussion is that it is very complex. Right? There is no like just do this. So, so for instance, the the latest spin on the eat less, move more thing has been uh, put out by the CrossFit crowd, which is well, just cut the carbs, get off the couch. It's like, this, yeah. dude, that's the same. Cut the carbs, get off the couch. Great. It's the same thing. Thanks. Obesity solved. Yeah, obesity solved. That's that's <laughs> the same thing, you know. And, and I I don't think that we need to take jabs at the at these people, but it, it's we need to also recognize like what that information actually boils down to. It's the same. Is 
eat less, move more. Just now you're picking certain things. And it's like, well, it's not incorrect, right? If you cut your carbohydrates and decrease your calorie intake, you're likely to move weight or, or lose weight. And if you exercise more than less, that's probably a good thing. Oh, all right, cool. That's not Nobel Prize material here. We're just, there, there's more nuances to to this. Uh, yeah, what's 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 so inherent about the refined carbohydrate? That I mean, are they going with the insulin a hypothesis of obesity that's been disproven multiple times? Or I don't know what they're getting at. I mean, obviously, eating refined carbohydrates probably doesn't help with satiety. So yeah, if you cut out refined carbohydrates and you eat more satiating. Uh, carbohydrates uh, from vegetables, then I, I think that's probably a good thing. But to to reduce it to that sound bite, I think isn't helpful for most people. And will actually, and it, it what it will do is, you know, I know their crowd, uh, and I think it's mostly a good thing for fitness. But um, I think they will all rally behind that. And the people that will fail, they will fail. It's not it's not a matter of if they fail doing that advice. No, they will fail. Uh, it's not going to be very helpful for them. They'll get discouraged and then they'll quit and it'll create uh, a dichotomy, uh, us versus them type of situation. So, so there's, so there's going to be a spectrum of response to that advice. There are going to be people who respond really well and have this, yeah. and, they, and they become, they, they become the people who get posted on the CrossFit main yep. Instagram page. And then there's going to be all the other people who that advice for whatever reason doesn't work as well for. And they're going to tell them they didn't do it right or yep. whatever. They didn't try hard enough. Yep. Exactly. And it's, it's just, it's just ignoring the complete complexity of obesity, uh, and it's just you know it's too bad. But because they could use that soundboard, their 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 platform. Um, oh man, the, the what they More. could do with that platform would yeah. be amazing. But yeah. hey, I'm not. Uh, you know, we're not, we're not on that platform, I guess. So I, maybe we should have been. That's yeah, yes, we did, we did this whole thing wrong. All right, well, well, <laughs> I know we're so, so you're shut it down. <laughs> barbell you know barbells and dumbbells and instead of whatever all right sorry <laughs> carry it carry on um yeah so so kind of on that same line you know we talked just briefly about the the low carb thing um uh, there's been a lot of new diets just cropping up here you know most famously ketos make another resurgence it seems like every like 10 years or so keto comes back and then people forget about it and then it comes back uh, every 20 years the hcg diet comes back and now and now we have the carnivore diet, which is my <laughs> one of my personal favorites. W- what do you think about these things? Like, what? Why are they g- sticky? Right? Like, why do people like latch onto them? And and then, w- as far as their efficacy is concerned, do you have any comments on that? Yeah. So it is. It's actually really interesting. I, I you know obviously these things always come in waves. Uh, it has to do with social behavior and whatever, and these marketers that are really good, but. I think patients have failed so much. Diet and exercise is tough. That's what we're talking about. Most people will fail, at least in the beginning, that attempt. Uh, I I don't like to say they fail until they completely give up, but uh, most people will have failed multiple diets in the past. So when somebody comes in and markets the fact that I got a new diet for you, don't worry. You failed all these diets in the past because they just didn't know what they were doing. I got a special thing for you. This thing doesn't matter what calories are. We're going to do this and manipulate your hormones and uh, you're going to have magical results. And lo and behold, there are going to be many people that are, will succeed in this and that selection bias that they post and, yes. and show, look, these people did it. Uh, it's, it'll get huge waves. So my, since patients fail and fail, of course, nobody wants to, nobody wants to actually learn about energy balance and, 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 and have to, actually know the science behind it. They want this magical ketogenic diet or, or fasting diet that that goes beyond the laws of physics and biology just to help them magically lose weight. Uh, and, and then what happens is that they eventually fail it, uh, except for a, a small select few of people. And so I think that's why these waves kind of come. And of course, the carnivore diet you know, it's doc, Dr. Sean uh, Baker um, is is kind of the big proponent. I think he's the big one behind it, orthopedic guy. Uh, and look, humans are humans can adapt to like most. I mean, we can adapt to some crazy diets. People can eat freaking bugs all day, probably if they wanted to. That's what I've been on. Um, people eat, the, yeah, <laughs> the bug diet, <laughs> the bug cricket, game, pow- I, cricket powder. Yeah, and 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 so people can survive on these uh, carnivore diets where they don't eat any plants. But to say that's 
the best diet or optimal is just silly. We can just adapt to multiple different things. You can eat mostly sugar if you wanted to, as long as you're getting your micronutrients in there and a little bit of protein and your fatty acids, just a little bit. Um, but you know, it's, it's just a, it's just a new spin marketing stuff. We, again, we're not just animals. We have social, um, you know, social psychology and marketing really can get to us. Yeah. It turns out we're like an adaptable, complex biological organism that allows us to like thrive, uh, in multiple situations and survive in, you know, infinite situations almost, you know? So it's been, there's a distinction between like what you can do and what you should do from like an optimal sort of health outcome standpoint. And it's just, yeah. Yeah. So people are like, Oh, well, you haven't read this one paper, that one weird paper that shows that ketogenic diets are like the truth. And it's like, Oh yeah, I must've missed that one. Like the one that just, you know, <laughs> like showed that it was superior to everything else. Uh, or, or, or the yeah. fact that on balance, any calorie, def uh, uh, calorie deficit produced by any intervention is likely to help you lose weight, you know? So, yeah, I mean, if, you know, they've done metabolic ward studies and, you know, Kevin Hall at the NIH, he's done the huge meta-analysis and showed, did the plot of all of these studies and, and where they match the protein and all the calories, low fat versus low carb metabolic ward studies. And they show eh, clinically just doesn't even matter. So let's just like, can we stop it? Nope. Please. And, and start getting, nope. yeah, no, we're not nope. going to anytime just, soon. Just like the number of creatine studies is going to continue to increase. The number of <laughs> dietary intervention studies are going to continue to increase. That's just, yeah. It's like, we just want to know we we're hoping for magic. Um, so I, I think you kind of probably alluded to this when you were talking about, uh, Dr. Hall's research, uh, you know, the meta analysis. So, so I'm assuming your general, like it, it, uh, recommendations for weight loss or weight maintenance would be, all right, we want a moderate to high protein diet, uh, a lot of, uh, high fiber, you know, foods, which include vegetables and, and, and fruits. And, and then the energy intake overall is going to be such that it controls your weight. That's the, is that the gist of your general recommendation? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, of course that, that comes, it starts boiling down to like eat less, move well, more. Well, yeah, right, when right, you really right. Look at it. But, but so from an individual standpoint, I, I, tr I, first of all, I see what kind of understanding they have of, of a lot of people don't understand how it works. They think they need to eat clean foods and, and I eat organic. I don't know why I'm not losing weight. I eat gluten free and it's just like, all right, let's back up here. Let's kind of go over this. Um, I'm fasting, I'm doing keto, I'm not losing weight. And it's like, okay, let's back up. So I do a little bit of a re-education and then we individualize it. We, we break it down. Yes, it is energy balance, but there's going to be whatever, there's going to be a negative energy balance in some sort of form of fashion, whether it's fasting, keto, whether it's calorie counting, macro counting, et cetera, that's going to allow you to be into an energy deficit without feeling miserable. That's it. That's, that's what we got to do. So whatever diet that is, and there may not be any specific diet, uh, because maybe then we need to add in medicines that hit those receptors in the brain that allow that person to comfortably reach that energy deficit that allows them to lose weight. Or maybe they'll eventually need surgery, which, you know, a lot of people are against. But, you know, sometimes you got to you got to pull the trigger on, on, on very invasive uh, things that get people to lose weight, unfortunately. So that's that's my approach. Very individualized. Yeah, that's actually a perfect segue. So do you have a sort of any clinical pearls where you're like, hey, you know what? Uh we're going to introduce a particular medication class to help you here, like adjunctive treatment. Yeah. So um, the, the, the people that qualify, when you look at just the FDA of how you're allowed to prescribe these medicines, it's anybody with a 30 BMI and over. Sweet. So basically you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. <laughs> Killing the game. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, but 30 BMI and over or those with a 27 BMI plus one of those comorbidities we talked about. Comorbidity meaning... Uh, something related to weight. So type 2 diabetes, prediabetes, uh, hypertension, and those types of things. So you can be 27 with one of those weight-related issues or 30 BMI and above. And basically what it comes down to, there, there are guidelines for this, um, and they'll say you got to try conservative therapy first, and if they fail, like just diet and exercise, they fail those, uh, then consider adding these medicines. But if somebody's failed so many times, they're coming to me like I get these I get the people that have failed every coach, every Weight Watchers multiple times, you know, meal replacement type stuff in the past. So in those types of people, I'm not just going to go, well, let me see if I can be a wizard and help you with some magical diet because it's not going to work and they're going to not come back. 
So in those types of people, I started my medicines right away. Mm -hmm. The other thing to key in on is some of these people asking them about hunger. Do you truly have hunger? Some people don't realize they do. They'll say they're eating 1,200 calories and they're not losing weight. And I'm kind of like, hmm, unless you have severe untreated hypothyroidism and you're, or you're four foot nothing female, uh, uh, 1,200 calories, you should probably be losing something. Yeah, it seems, unlike, seems um, unlikely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, 99.9% of the time they're underreporting. And, you know, but the shorter you are, the more precision you have to have towards that 1,200 calories. So in those people who swear they're eating 1,200 calories, I've put them on medicines. And sometimes they lose like 50 pounds and it's like, you are way off. <laughs> like, you are so far off that it's like, so, in, so yeah. And a lot of these patients, I start them right away on medicines, but I try to get a feel for, are you hungry? And a lot of people just may, maybe not admit it because they just don't want to, I don't know. They don't want to feel weak minded or whatever, but I try to explain to them, look, these mes- these medicines are not fat burners. They are not DNP uncouplers. Where you're oh, gonna, God. You're gonna <laughs> oh, they're not. I don't want them. they're they're not going to burn through your clothes while you sit there and sweat (laughs) like a pig you know type of thing so uh uh, no they're you know they they're simply appetite suppressants that work at various parts of the brain and um all they do is help you feel comfortable while you reduce your energy intake that's it not super magical but there are multiple different types you can use and some people respond to some and some don't and we don't have tests right now to see who will respond to one to know which which right one to pick from the beginning. But um, that's why we have to have them come back uh, for checkups and to see, make sure the weight's coming down mm-hmm. and then ch- change if we need to. Yeah, I was just thinking that you would do a 23andMe test and then you would be able to tell like which uh, medication class they're likely to. <laughs> God, I, I wish. That would make our life so much. I mean, yeah. you know in the future they're going to have that stuff. To where, like, you know, like, they're not even going to need us. We're just going to be the ones kind of dispensing the medicine, I, I think, I, at some point. It's not anytime soon, but, uh, uh, yeah, we're not there You get yet. an adiponect and a pregnant alone and a 23 and me, and then you can <laughs> – <Yeah. laughs> sorry, I shouldn't be so salty. It's just, you know, it, it, I think it, if we um, if we take Spencer's, dis, you know, discussion of this, it, it's very important. So, uh, for instance, if I get somebody who inquires, they want coaching, like nutritional uh, – con- consult uh on on what they should do and they've worked with four other coaches before and they're still significantly overweight or 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 still still obese you know my routine recommendation is you need you need to see either an obesity specialist or or uh uh some other medical professional in person to evaluate you for do you need medical therapy or do you need surgery because honestly at that point it's unethical for me in my opinion to like I'm not creating magic with, you know, uh, my accountability processes are so unique that, you know, I'm, this is going to work or like, I'm not showing up at your house and like, you know, uh, forcing you at gunpoint to not eat because it's just, um, yeah, that I see that all the time. And in my opinion, that's almost, that's mismanagement. You know, if you have somebody who's failed multiple types of conservative therapy, then you, you have to escalate. All right. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. This is the Barbell Medicine Podcast, episode number 26, part one of two with Dr. Spencer Nadolsky. Part two will be posted next Monday on our YouTube channel and all the places you normally get your podcast from. If you want to find out more about Barbell Medicine, check us out at our website, barbellmedicine.com, and check us out at a seminar near you. We do have seminars coming up this year. First off, in July, we'll be in Brooklyn, New York for a full Barbell Medicine seminar. We'll also be in Seattle, Washington in September. For those of you who are just looking to improve your lifts or want some one-on-one coaching, check us out. We'll be in Santa Cruz for a one-day training camp. We're going to cover the squat, the bench press, the deadlift, and the press, along with the Q&A afterwards. Uh, my favorite part of the seminar was uh, how concise and simply the information was laid out. I really enjoyed the lifting instruction, particularly Alan Thrall who gave very good, concise cues that really helped me out. A lot of the cueing I received uh, at the seminar helped me you know, clear up a lot of things that I was wondering about. Uh, understanding how like resistance training and how using a barbell and getting strong helps 
like health outcomes to me is, is really fascinating actually. If you're part of the seminar, it was probably a pain, pain uh, lecture. Uh, growing my knowledge bank as a strength and conditioning coach, when you think you know things, you come to this, you're gonna find out that maybe you don't and that you're going to learn a lot more and help as many people as possible. So thanks guys. Well, I learned a ton. Uh, definitely the pain stuff wasn't something I was expecting, like just how much I didn't know about that. I think my favorite part of the seminar was interacting with all the individual coaches. They all have their own particular style, their own particular way of teaching, and getting to rotate through the coaches gives you a really good, I guess, perspective and look at ways to improve each of the lifts. So head over to the barbellmedicine.com website and register today.